Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Talent Experience Live, the show that covers everything that you need to know in talent acquisition, talent management, recruiting, and human resources combined. I know today we're talking a bit about talent acquisition and the cost of candidate churn. I, of course, am your host, Devin Foster, and this program, Talent Experience Live, is proudly brought to you by the good folks here at Phenom, whose purpose is to help 1 billion people find the right job. Of course, that is not a typo. It is why we create the technology that we do, like Phenom X Plus, our generative AI. It is why we help with challenges such as candidate churn and everything in between. And you may be asking yourselves, Devin, how do you help a billion people find the right job? All you do is, is create technology. Well, our technology isn't isn't that simple. Uh, it's simple to use, but actually it's an intelligent talent experience platform that helps candidates find the right fit faster, employees evolve in their current roles and beyond. Uh, recruiters achieve next level productivity as well as efficiency, and managers build better teams through data analytics and of course, automation. And you can't say automation without mentioning artificial intelligence as well. And of course, Phenom is powered by super slick AI and machine learning that is on the back end. You never feel it as a front end user. You never have to type in any of those prompts uh, that you see on TikTok or Instagram or anything like that right now. So if any of this interests you at all, if you would like to learn uh, how to help candidates find the right fit faster, how to help employees evolve in their current roles and beyond, how to see recruiters get next level productivity, or how to empower managers uh, to leverage data and, and really see better results, head on over to phenom.com. Run, do not walk, although we promise the website will be there if you do walk <laughs> up to the website. Anywho, today we are talking about why candidate churn is costing your organization millions, and it is a super exciting topic. But before we get into that, I want to start the program off with a nice little icebreaker and ask you, the audience at home, uh, it's obviously summer blockbuster movie season. Uh, we have seen the latest edition of Fast and Furious come out. Uh, Oppenheimer is coming out very soon, as well as Barbie. Very interesting that both of those are coming out on the same day. But I want to know you, the audience at home, what is your favorite summer blockbuster movie? Uh, mine is quite simple. It's Bad Boys 2. Um, I was too young to really appreciate the original Bad Boys. Uh, but the second version of that is hands down one of my favorites. Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, a comedic duo that I don't think anybody could have prepared to be that funny in the first one, let alone the second one. My dad and I quote it all the time. It's one thing that we do every single Father's Day. Uh, so let me know, what is your favorite summer blockbuster movie as we talk about why candidate churn is costing your organization millions? Obviously, attracting top talent to organizations is crucial. However, a staggeringly poor candidate experience can really cripple the entire organization, especially when it comes to recruiting funnel leads uh, and candidate churn and everything like that in between. Today, we are talking about the hidden cost associated with candidate churn, that point where someone clicks on apply and then they never complete it. I, I see Jen uh, chiming in in the comment section. She says, Jaws, uh, classic, absolutely fantastic movie. Uh, actually, loosely based, a lot of people don't know this, on shark attacks on Long Beach Island, uh, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, so look into that. Some interesting history there, if, if you must. But back to uh, the current shark attack that organizations are dealing with today. It's candidate churn. And today we have a very special guest to chat more about it. It is Joe Motter, who is VP of Marketing at Brazen. And without any further hesitation, Let's bring Joe onto the program to talk about why candidate churn is potentially costing your organization millions of dollars. Joe, how are you? Good, Devin. So, uh, so grateful to be here. Thanks for that introduction, and um, yeah, excited to be on the show. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you. Um, but of course, whenever you come onto the show, you, you don't get to escape the hot seat right away or the icebreaker <laughs> question. So I have to ask you, do you have a favorite 
summer blockbuster movie uh, that you can still watch uh, with all the content that we are provided today as really humans on Earth? Well, it's interesting. The first movie that came to mind for me, which I have watched frequently over the years, is a, a Will Smith movie, uh, not Bad Boys, but Independence Day. Anytime yes. I think of uh, summer blockbusters, it's it's definitely Independence Day. Great movie, although it's interesting that both you and I chose Will Smith movies. I'm not sure like how my perception has changed of those movies ever since the drama about a year ago. Um, so yeah, no, I. I fair point um i try and as a will smith fan i'm gonna try and avoid that conversation <laughs> right now um uh, but but neither here nor there um jill a, a independence day a great film might be turning into a documentary sooner or later with other things that have been in the news but we won't get into that uh, today we're here talking about candidate churn however I want to find out from you first. Uh, another question we love to ask our guests is how they end up in the realm of human resources. Uh, I have a, a very young daughter right now. She doesn't know what she wants to be when she grows up, but rarely do people say they want to grow up and be involved in human resources, whether it's working on the marketing side, being a recruiter, uh, being a CHRO or anything in between. So I, I want to ask you, how did you end up in this this role at Brazen? And, and also, what does Brazen do in the really a megaverse of human resources. Yeah, I mean, just for clarification on, on pronunciation, uh, it's brazen, but great oh. question. No worries, Devin. It's, um, but how did I get into this space? Um, it's actually, I think, a pretty cool story. Um, so I started my career working for a marketing agency. So uh, helping clients with their marketing, you know, creating, you know, video content and website content to help them attract buyers, right? And so through that work, a lot of the organizations that we worked with, we worked with other marketers within those organizations, a lot of times they would talk to their talent acquisition teams and they would say, hey, we, we love this agency. We love these, you know, these marketers that are helping us attract customers. And, you know, this is like 10 plus years ago and talent acquisition 10 plus years ago, similar today, was struggling to find talent. And they're like, hey, it could like we talk to that marketing agency that you're working with. Maybe they could help us create video content. Maybe they could help us elevate the content on our career site to like, do the same thing, except for job seekers, right? Could they help us find job seekers? And that's exactly what we started to do. We actually started to work with the talent acquisition teams. We started to work with recruitment marketers to create culture videos to really highlight what makes that organization special, again, to help them attract the best talent in the world. So got my start, you know, in, in TA on, on, the, uh, on the agency side. And then you know, I moved out to DC five, six years ago and uh, got connected to, to Brazen, um, which was a, an up and coming, um, you know, startup at the time that would introduced a virtual hiring event platform to the market um, to, again, I think do something very similar, which is provide an experience for candidates through technology that's different than the apply now, right? Like the, it's, it's too often the case where organizations try to offer something that candidates aren't ready for, which is the application, right? There's, I think, more that candidates demand and want. And Brazen, through our virtual technology, allows organizations to provide that to candidates, to attract the best candidates. So I head up marketing, like you said, here at Brazen. So it's just like this great mix where I'm helping to sell Brazen to more TA professionals, yet at the same time, I get to engage and interact and use my skill set as a marketer to work closely with recruiting professionals and recruitment marketing and employee, employer branding professionals uh, to, to do what they love to do, um, which is what I love yeah. to do. Yeah. No, it's 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 funny that you mentioned, uh, you know, the the contrast uh, or similarities, I should say, between uh, traditional marketing and r recruitment marketing. Because 10, 10 years ago is when I started my career and I would attend career fairs and things like that. And the, the big sell at a career fair was the tchotchkes, right? It was the pens with your company name on it. It was 
the ping pong balls or whatever it may be to try and attract folks to your table uh, to tell them about the organization, right? Candidates had that those questions and things like that, at least early on in, in, in my career. Uh, and that's where I got my start in, in really talent acquisition as a whole. But when we fast forward to today and, and you mention the similarities between what it's like to purchase a product and what it is like to, to purchase an application almost, if we can connect those dots there where it's, let's tell them all about the organization. One thing that you can't do, which I, I've noticed a lot of e-commerce sites doing is they'll almost offer discounts. Have you seen the little spinning wheels where it's like, oh, you know, add to cart, here's 10% off, or here's a free shipping, whatever mm -hmm. it may be really do that for the application process. So there's going to be a disconnect at some point where we can stop stealing ideas from traditional marketers. But I want to ask you before we we really get into the, the crux of this, uh, what are some common factors that you're noticing when it comes to candidate churn as a whole? What are some of these uh, contributing factors for organizations with, quite frankly, a large number of open jobs that we see all the time in the news? Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a, a great analogy. I mean, e-commerce, e you know, I just we as consumers expect what I would say it's it's this on-demand economy, right? We expect things fast, we expect transparency, and we expect personalization, right? And you know, I think of like um, you know, Amazon, right? I I know that the if I order something, it's going to be here quickly. Um, in either case, I always know exactly where it is in the process for delivery. And Amazon does a great job of personalizing the experience. They know exactly what sort of products that they need to advertise to me based off of maybe my past purchase history, or maybe they have information around what I consume, you know, even outside of um, what I purchase. And they personalize that experience that, you know, makes me more likely to continue to engage with, with Amazon. So like you said, I just think there's a ton we can learn from that when it comes to, to talent acquisition, when it comes to creating a really great experience for candidates. And actually, I actually think, you know, you talked about like, you know, the discount option that pops up you know, when on an e-commerce site, when they're trying to get you to to take that last step and purchase, like, I don't think that there's like a perfect analogy in talent acquisition. Like, yeah, we're not going to like discount our, our jobs or, you know, but um, yeah, I think that it, it comes down to like that e-commerce company is trying to give that consumer something. And so I think talent acquisition professionals or employers can learn from that. And like, what more can you give? And I, I, we're going to get into this later, but I just wanted to like kind of plant the seed. Like, what can you do for candidates that's going above and beyond, just like a discount is going above and beyond? Absolutely. It's a give and take, right? The entire process. I yeah. oftentimes say that sales and recruiting are so synonymous because recruiters are selling their organization. They're selling the job, right? Everyone is always a little hesitant. And to steal from e-commerce even more, candidates are more savvy than they've ever been before. They are combing through Glassdoor reviews, in some cases, G2 and, and technological reviews in order to see, is this company all that they're uh, you know cracked up to be? And you mentioned Amazon, one of their biggest tactics is the reviews, right? We we don't necessarily yeah. shop anymore with reviewing, and that goes for any part. I review video games before I purchase them, right? Like I yeah. I watch a YouTube video and and all sorts of this these these different avenues to become more educated. So to your point, where organizations have to offer things, I, I think there certainly is something to be said there, but we can get into that a little bit later. Obviously, the big topic that we're talking about today is the cost of candidate churn. So I think back to my days as a recruiter where you know there was costs to post on job boards, there were costs to attend career fairs, and then I moved into the staffing agencies, and obviously those have costs associated to them. When it comes to the expenses in recruitment, is it limited, in your opinion, to just simply those things that you write check for, or checks for at the end of the day? And how can you really calculate that when you're dealing with a large number of positions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it certainly does you know, um, include those 
costs. Um, you know, it, it costs money, like you said, to advertise your jobs. Um, it costs money to to get those those applicants in the form of like real hard dollars that you're paying out to, to job boards. Certainly that that is a part of it. I mean, you know, digging a little deeper or peeling back, uh, you know, a couple more layers. I mean, there's the time that it takes somebody to create that compelling job description. There's the time it takes that recruiter to maybe do an intake meeting with a hiring manager. So now there's the hiring manager's time. So like there's time involved, like hours that it takes to do this recruiting, right? And so when we'll get into some of you know, how this adds up to, to candidate churn a little bit later, um, maybe you know, some other things that don't get factored in as often into this conversation are things like, you know, if, if, if I'm a, a recruiter, if I'm an organization that let's say is hiring for, I have a dentist appointment next week, right? So I'm just going to say, say I'm an organization that's hiring for a dentist. That yep. dentist is a revenue creator for that organization. Every day, every hour that that dentist is not on board and actually generating revenue for my organization. In other words, helping customers um, with their dental needs. That's lot. That's missed revenue, right? And that's that's a cost, right? Missing out on that revenue can really add up for an organization. And so, like when we when we talk about time to hire, it isn't just a a, a nice to have metric that you know organizations or TA teams need to be measuring. There's there's a real cost to to extending that that time to hire out, and which certainly relates back to if candidates are churning, it's going to add up. Yeah, I, I'll take it a step further. You mentioned dentists and that being a revenue driving position. When you think of customer service, oftentimes those are kind of viewed as as cost centers, right? Like it, it is just a necessity of the business to deal with issues. But if you do have open roles in those positions that, that may be even high turnover positions once they're employees, uh, I worked in customer service. It was not my strong suit, Joe. I, I will let you know right now. Um, but it, it, when it comes to the the customer experience of that, where they've raised their hand and said, "I have an issue. I need help." If you don't have enough people to fill that, that could cost the business in ways that that you don't even know. Am I way off there with that thought process, or is that something that that you've seen as well in, in some of your studies? Yeah, no, absolutely. We at Brazen, we actually work with a ton of customers that hire for those customer service type roles. And the reason why it's so important to that organization to fill those roles as quickly as possible and keep those people in those roles is because those customers that those customer service folks are helping, if they provide a bad experience, they're no longer going to become be, be a customer of that company. And that's lost revenue or it it adds additional costs to the organization to try to win a customer back, right? Not just the cost that it takes to fill that customer service position, but it costs money, the marketing team, the sales team, whatever it is, they now have to go out and find new customers. And in marketing and in sales, we know that it costs up to 10 times more to bring on a new customer. And so I, I love your example of like the importance of having those customer service roles in uh, in organizations really can can play a huge role in saving costs that that company doesn't have to spend to bring in new new customers. Yeah, it, it happened to me yesterday. I, I called a, a ticketing service. I won't mention them by name, but I was caller number three in line. I thought, oh, I'm going to be answered within the next 30 seconds. I was on hold mm -hmm. for 15 minutes. Right. And mm -hmm. these things happen. I'm still going to be a customer. No hard feelings to that organization. I understand there's Taylor Swift <laughs> concerts going on. There's lots of things happening right now. My issue is not the big one. But what we're talking about these really, I think, extraordinary situations, right, where all of these expenses are, are adding up. But when it comes to the application process, how does that play a role, right, it, within candidate churn? And, and how can it essentially prevent attrition over time or, or how can organizations look to really rectify what may be a, a poor candidate experience? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll actually um, reference some research that was done in the past year from AppCast, and they looked at how the um, application length, um, like how much time does it take a candidate to fill out an application, as well as they looked at how many questions a application has. Certainly the two are, are highly correlated, but they looked at both. Um, and it's just like, you know, crazy how the uh, uh, completion rate goes down the more questions you have and the longer it takes a candidate to, to fill out an app application. And that's not like anything like surprising for those of you that are tuning in. You're going to be like, duh, Joe, that makes a lot of sense. But I think what's really stood out to me is when you look at the research, it's just the magnitude of completion rates between you know different scenarios so i'll read off some numbers here so a uh, organization that has a um, application that takes 15 minutes or longer only 3.5 percent of applicants that start that application complete it 3.5 percent just think of how many how many applicants how many candidates you're losing because you decided to put uh, uh, application together that re requires 15 or more minutes, right? And like on the other side, like if you can get that application time between one and five minutes, and we have lots of customers that do are doing this, and we can talk about how they're doing it, but if you can get it down to one to five minutes, your completion rates jump up to almost 15%. That's 5x, right? Like, and like even 15% doesn't sound like a lot. You're still losing a lot, but you're getting five times the payback just by shortening your application by, you know, 10 minutes or so. And so like just the, 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 the benefit of thinking about the application, the length of it, and there's data here on the number of questions that I won't get into because it's very similar, but you can just get huge returns by thinking about the length and the number of questions. Yeah. And, and the type of questions, I'm, I'm sure as well. I, I know from my job search experience where I thought I had prepared, I thought I knew everything, but simple questions like what is, you know, your primary contacts number or the phone number of the last business that you worked. I've seen those on application processes before mm -hmm. and I have to leave that application and go onto Google and type in, you know, what is XYZ organization's number because I texted my boss or I had them programmed in my phone whenever it was a sick yeah. day or, or whatever it may be. Um, so simple things like that could probably shorten your application and, and hopefully achieve some of that that 5x increase in applicants that, that you're referring to. Obviously, we we kicked off the, the show talking about it's costing organizations millions, right, in, in candidate churn. Mm -hmm. Is there an effective way for organizations to take a look at their you know, current spend or their current application process and really figure out what their spend could be and, and potentially reduce it? Yeah, um, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, so I think if you know, most organizations are, are looking at their funnel conversion metrics, like of the number of applications that I get, how many of those are qualified and move on to, let's say, a screening interview with a recruiter? And then what percent of, of those screens that I do move on to an interview with a hiring manager? And what percent of those interviews with the hiring manager do we make offers to? And then what percent of those offers that we make, you know, accept and start on day one, right? And, you know, there's maybe different variations of that. But in general, that's a, a pretty common, you know, recruiting funnel that I think most organizations are keeping track of. And so the way to start thinking about your, your candidate or the cost of candidate churn is to start to play around with, okay, if I typically get about 20% of my applicants, right? Let's say I have a hundred applicants, make this really easy. I typically get 20% of them to move on to that screen with the recruiters, right? So 20 screens that I typically do. Yep. Let's just say I've got a bad month or a bad couple months and my, you know, I'm providing a bad candidate experience. I'm not following up in a timely manner, right? Going back to what we talked about with the on-demand economy that we kicked the show off talking yep. about, like I need to speed 
I need personalization and I need transparency. If I'm not doing all of those things, right, there's a good chance that the top applicants are going to drop out and go to my competition, right? The ones that maybe could more quickly respond to that applicant or create a more personalized experience, whatever it may be. So if I'm losing candidates at that stage in the funnel, right? And so my, my conversion rate drops from 20% to 10%. That means that you're not going to have as many candidates in your funnel that you need to ultimately fill that role. Right. And so the way to start calculating what's the cost of that is now tying back to some of the, the things that you and I talked about that are tied to candidate churn costs. Like if I don't have enough candidates or applicants in my funnel because they dropped out, what do I have to go do? I have to go write a check to I don't know. People don't write checks anymore, but I have to go um, pay uh, the job boards to open my position back up and get more applicants. That costs money. I have to understand that I'm not likely going to fill this role as quickly, right? Lost revenue. That's going to cost um, my organization money and lost revenue. So now you can start to look at, so now that I know what my, my cost levers are, let's just take the application one, which is pretty easy. By the way, I don't know if you can hear, but the fire alarm is going off in my building. Hopefully that's not do you need to do you need to go? Are you are you all right? I think they're testing it. Okay. Um I should be good. I just all right. Yeah. If if anything changes, just hop off. There is I know <laughs> that we're talking about the the candidate and talent experience, yeah, uh, or excuse me, talent acquisition essentially being on fire, but not literally. Yes. So not literally, please. yes. It, it, it is an emergency in talent acquisition that we get this yes. uh, figured out, but maybe not as uh, big of an emergency as it would be if there really was a fire here at my building. Yeah. Um, anyways, so we'll take the applications, right? If I've got to go pay a job board more money, like most organizations have a pretty good idea how much an application costs, right? And th there's lots of data out there. You can estimate this or use your own data that you have internally. But you know, a lot of estimates put the average application, again, this just varies so much, but around $25. It could be anywhere between a dollar and $500, depending on the type of role, depending on how efficient your organization is at you know, spending your sourcing and advertising dollars. But let's just say $25 uh, per applicant, right? And some organizations, like they have to go fill that funnel back up with dozens if not hundreds of new applicants because they lost so many throughout that process. And so I've done a lot of this you know, work and, and looked at this for some like very common scenarios. And on average, organizations per open rec, um, if they're dropping their, their candidates out of the funnel um, at the rate of going from 20% to 10%, it costs them about 2,500 additional dollars per open job rec to actually be able to fill that role, just looking at that one factor, the applications. And so you can see how, you know, that can start to add up for an organization that is doing this across the board, across all of their roles, not providing a great candidate experience. That $2,500 can quickly become millions of dollars, which is, you know, really what the title of today's uh, episode is all about. Yeah, I, I mean, especially when you compound it over, positions, right? I, I mean, we talked a, a little bit there about the customer service roles and, and sales roles. Oftentimes, those are evergreen positions that are going to be open uh, throughout the course of the year. So if you have to, you know, excuse my analogy here, but run back to the ocean and fill up that water again and try and dump it into a hole in the sand, it's just going to, it's a bottomless pit, right? At the end of the day. So that, that $2,500 adds up, even though it starts at something as, as minuscule um, as, as $25 per application. Uh, imagine right. charging somebody $25 to, to apply to your job, right? That it adds up quickly and you wouldn't have any applicants. But we've talked about some of the negatives here, Joe. I, wa I want to offer some solutions to some folks who may be tuning in. So what are some strategies that, uh, you know, organizations can implement for attracting and engaging talent to minimize some of this, this churn that we've, we've talked about. 
Yeah, absolutely. We started to touch on some of these things. I mean, we talked about the application process, and I know you gave some great advice around, you know, thinking about the questions that you're asking, like, are they really necessary? Some other things that I would mention when it comes to just the, um, I'll call it the application process, but really I want, I think, folks to think about, like, how do we start to build a candidate pipeline? And it doesn't always have to start with an application. In fact, really, that's how Brazen uh, became to be, is, you know, our founders realized that candidates have questions, they, you know, want that kind of human connection before they're even going to think about applying to a job. For many roles, there's a requirement that candidates kind of get to know you, right? We can start to, you know, think about, um, you know, events, you know, virtual events or in-person events, collecting registration information, right? How, how simple is it and how quick is it for someone to give you their name and their email? Now they're in your database, right? They're not an applicant necessarily, but now you, you started to nurture and plant the seed to build a relationship. And that's what candidates want. And that's what organizations need to do. They need to focus on building and nurturing those relationships. Even little things like, um, I know a lot of organizations and, you know, Brazen offer the, offers this. Uh, I believe Phenom does as well, but the concept of a, a chat bot on yeah. the career site, right? To, again, the, a lot of times that candidates on the career site, maybe they're on your job rec and they're not yet ready to apply, but they have questions. They can start to engage with that chat bot. And what do those chat bots typically do first and foremost? They ask, what's your name? What's your email address, right? That's capturing of candidate information. And most of us are, are willing to, as long as we know that there's going to be something in return, like getting my questions answered or talking to an actual human at some point, we're willing to give our, our email and, and our name to, to do that. And so thinking about how do we build this candidate database is going to, I think, set us up for success as opposed to just relying on the application. Yeah, no, I, I think you raise a few excellent points there. And immediately I think of, again, the, the shopping experience, right, where you have to create this pool of, of potential customers even if they are shopping in a store, right? It, that's why there are Super Bowl ads that go for millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's creating that brand recognition. The same thing applies when when folks are, are looking for jobs. They can apply to any job that that is out there. They're going to choose the one that they recognize, that they're familiar with, that shows up in their search terms or what their work history aligns with. And it's the role of talent acquisition teams to get their name out there, however that may be. So I, I want to ask you a, a question of what are some strategies to fill that bucket uh, and as it relates to content? So obviously you, you mentioned their career fairs, different job fairs, things like that. Does content play a big role in this, even in the application process itself? And, and what does that look like? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, content is is king and and queen and and whatever other you know cliche you want to use. Um, you know, within virtual hiring events, within in person events, on your career site, content is the thing that is going to um, influence candidate behaviors, right? Like candidates and job seekers, they want to envision themselves in this role. They want to understand clearly what benefits this job or this career is going to provide to me. Um, and so content's a great way to, to tell that company story, right? And so, you know, some things that I've seen um, that work really, really well when it comes to content is having your actual employees that would be working with this, you know, this future employee talk about um, in a, in a video format or in some sort of article, um, what a day in the life is uh, at that organization. What are the projects that I'm working on? Don't um, I would you know, caution against the more generic, like listing of here's our benefits and, you know, here's the responsibilities. People can get that on your, you know, career site or in the job rec, like that's a fine place for those things. But you really want to open up and provide some color 
for your organization through storytelling, through your employees, through that are actually working on these projects, right? And that's like like that. I think we we all like when when we're buying something, right? Like we don't we want to reduce the risk. And how do we reduce? How does how do we feel more confident and less fearful that you know a product is going to actually do what it says it's going to do? we actually listen to others that have used it or we, you know, have that um, organization. And you mentioned that before reviews, we all use reviews or we like listen to that organization kind of unbox whatever this you know, product is and, and talk about it in, in, in detail. And so, yeah, I think that you know, if you can start with like getting actual people who have experience with this product, which is the job um, and, getting that content in a way that is consumable from the job seeker or candidate's perspective, whether it is during a live webinar from an employee during a virtual event, or whether it's a video that your employer brand or recruitment marketing team creates and shares on your website or shares through, through video. I think those are the types of things that you're going to be able to leverage to influence candidate behavior. Yeah, it, real real stories at, at the end of the day. I mean, uh, we've all seen the commercials where it's paid actors, right? And they kind of put that disclosure disclaimer right in the, the bottom corner, uh, kind of make it really o- opaque so you can't really see it, whatever, whatever it may be. And then you look at, and I'm not afraid to mention this, a commercial like Chick-fil-A where they tell a real customer story and a real employee story all in one. There's a reason why their employer brand is is so strong. It's because they're willing to share those stories. And I'd love to see more organizations do it. And you don't have to have Chick-fil-A's budget to do it, right? At the end of the day, you don't have to put it on a commercial during Sunday football or whatever it may be. It can simply be on your career site, on your social channels, these places where people interact with your brand Because oftentimes customers do become employees and employees are customers. So sharing those two and taking those same tactics are there. This has been an awesome conversation, Joe. Is the fire alarm still going off? Because I am worried. I I want to make sure. I'm safe. The the fire alarm is off. Thank you for asking. No more more emergencies, at least uh, behind me here at, at my apartment. Okay. All right. Perfect. That's fantastic. Um, I, obviously, we unpacked a, a ton of great things today. But where can folks go if they want to, you know, hear some more success stories, see how organizations have effectively lessened that million dollar dollar churn that we talked about? Where can they either speak with you or or, or learn more more as a whole? Yeah, please definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm fairly active on LinkedIn and do post all of the content that we talked and discussed here today in longer form content on on LinkedIn. Um, Also, I host the podcast, um, Talent on the Rise, where I speak with practitioners who are facing all the same challenges that I'm guessing many of you listening in here today are facing. We talk with, um, you know, chief people officers, CHROs, and, you know, get advice from them on how they're tackling these these really important challenges to help their organizations um, not just survive, but thrive. That's such a cliche, but I'm going to use it. Um, so follow us, Talent on the Rise. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, and follow me on, on LinkedIn. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate it. I will let you get back to your busy day. Happy to hear that there was not a fire, but (laughs) the fire alarms are sounding off. Candidate churn is costing organizations millions of dollars. I love the prop use. Fantastic. (laughs) And uh, I did it on purpose. You you called your building, your super, whoever it may be, and said, Yeah, 1225, set off the alarms. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, Well, enjoy uh, your summer. Hopefully, we'll have you on again in, in the fall to talk maybe about Canada churn only costing $750,000 or whatever it may be be because we've we've helped solve some of this issue. Uh, Enjoy everything. I hope you get to watch Independence Day sooner rather than later, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Devin. Great being here. Once again, we were chatting with Joe from Brazen there uh, all about candidate churn and, and really how a $25 application being the cost that it costs to get candidates in your door can compile. Uh, And there are many different levers, many different things that add to this million dollars worth of churn that we talked about. But truthfully, 
the easiest way to solve it is by making your candidate experience better. Uh, Joe mentioned the chat bot. We talked about chat bots during the state of candidate experience a benchmark report episode last week, 85% of the fortune 500 do not have them on their career site. You may be one of them. This is could be compiling, compiling, excuse me, towards your candidate churn that's costing your organization millions and millions of dollars. We're all looking to tighten the belt right now based on the economy. So these are some ways that you can resolve it. Connect with Joe on LinkedIn, uh, tune into his podcast as well. And I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Tune in next week. I'm going to be joined uh, by Ed Newman of Talent EXP. Uh, we have an exciting episode there, and I hope that everyone has a safe, healthy summer weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks.